When our emotions lessen around events, which are our filters, and our beliefs begin to change, and our values become aligned, the capability of placing a different meaning around the events that used to trigger us is so much easier. Any successful relationship starts with finding your center, the truth at the core of who you are. Only then can you develop the ability to truly connect with someone else. Concentric is about aligning with people who share a common center. This show gives you the tools and the skills to do just that through practical training, real life stories and examples, and in-depth interviews with people who have taken this journey and come out the other side better for it. Welcome to Concentric. We're glad you're here. Welcome to episode nine of Concentric. Uh, I'm excited to bring this episode to you. We we really dive in on this concept of self leadership quite a bit on this show already, um, because it's so foundational to everything else um, that we teach and advise and really just that we believe in <laughs> in this world. You know. Um, taking that control over your own experience in life rather than leaving it up to the rest of the world to to dictate how you're going to feel or how you're going to operate. Um, And maybe it sounds simple, but it's, you know, it's tough when we do get triggered by things out in the world and we react to that triggering event rather than stopping and going, okay, why am I so upset about this or even so happy about this or whatever that may be. Gary dives into how important, you know, our mental state, our emotional state is to just being consistent and congruent and showing up in life, how we want to show up. And certainly when it comes to leading others, right, we can't possibly do that without, leading ourselves first. So this is an amazing foundational episode that Gary really gives us some some wonderful, you know, insight around on exactly how to do this because especially in the moment, it's it's very difficult to course correct when you are being triggered by something. Um, so it takes that foundational work beforehand so that in the moment you can you know, call upon <laughs> that decision that you've made um, or insights that you've gained so that you don't have that same emotional response that you did in the past. All right, let's jump in. Welcome to another episode of Concentric. Gary, how is it going? Oh, I'm great. I'm great today. I really appreciate you asking and I'm looking forward to what we're going to talk about next, whatever that is, because you know, you and I do not have this scripted. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, you know, we, we come up with these kind of concepts. We, we both have like, hey, this would be really great to talk about this week or th- that um, a lot of things, you know, I get from things I've just learned from you and have really sparked something and I'll make sure that that gets jotted down. Like, okay, we've got to we've got to d- dig deep in, into this one. And today's topic I wanted to go through is exactly one of those. Um, it's something that a concept that you talk about called you know mental emotional triggers, and it and it really I, I I feel like I say this on a lot of episodes, but it's another it's another foundational one, right? To to being a better human and being better in relationships, um, and it really comes down to to managing. Your, yourself. And I think there's, you know, there's a concept or two even before that to kind of grasp, grasp that we'll go into. Um, but it's really around this concept that it all comes down to you. You're, <laughs> you're in control of you. And if you can start with that mindset, everything else gets a whole lot easier, honestly. That's the understatement of, um, of all of our conversations, <laughs> because the more that we can take accountability for the emotional states that we enter into, um, the more that we can actually look at uh, a situation and ask ourselves this question, how many different ways can I look at this to return me back to myself, my core, 
Now, that presupposes we know what our core is, and that presupposes that we've set and established what we feel we stand for in life. And it is more than being in a relationship with another. It's about being in a deep, profound relationship with ourselves. So remember one episode we spoke about values. That's a very beginning step in being able to say, okay, this is my mission based upon my top five values. And that's a perfect place to start. Yeah. One of the things that I absolutely know is that we had spoken previously about the drama triangle. And this is one of the keys, one of the mental emotional management keys to our own self leadership. I'm a big proponent of self leadership. When I go into organizations and I, and I speak about leadership, this is where we start. Because we cannot speak about leading others unless we can lead ourselves. And again, I'll go back to what Peter Drucker said. The definition of leadership is literally consistent, congruent behavior. You cannot have that unless you yourself have a deep, profound relationship with you and what you stand for so that the mental emotional management skills allows you to have consistent congruent behavior because all behavior is based upon your emotional states if you do not have mental emotional management skills you cannot possibly be consistent and congruent that engenders trust in another whether it's your partner or whether it's your direct reports so yeah, this yeah. becomes a super important ingredient to all of our successes. Do you ever get pushback at the top when you go in there? Because I know when you do go and work with an organization, it is it is top down. You know the reality of that, and that's how you diagnose and <laughs> prescribe both. You know, so is there because a lot of times I'm sure you're you're brought in like, hey, my organization has this issue. And you kind of come in and find a way to say they do, but we're going to start with you. <laughs> is there is there pushback on that a lot of times? Absolutely. Um, and what I'll say is that when a leader, like I don't I don't go into organizations where I have to pull a camel through the eye of a needle. I just say, well, this isn't a match mm -hmm. because at the top, if the leader is 100% focused on their bottom line without looking at what has caused the deterioration of their bottom line and will not take responsibility because ultimately at the end of the day, it's up to the leader to lead. And in order to do that, you have to have clarity. You have to be able to inspire those to innovate, to create new solutions out of the historical problems that have been present that got you to the place where your bottom line is deteriorating. So there's a variety of different aspects of that problem that has, you know, operations and management and HR and people development and supply chain, and the list just goes on and on and on. But it still comes down to you're at the top, you're leading. And this is what happens for many, and this goes right back to the drama triangle. If a leader is allowing themselves to enter into victim, they'll look for something to blame, the villain. And the villain can be multiple things. Unless that leader steps into full ownership, they're not going to be effective. Yeah. And so this is where... When I go into organizations and I explain that full ownership is the absolute foundation for being able to lead a team to success, that means innovating, creating thinking and innovation pods, allowing them to, to go through a seven perspective thinking strategy to generate ideas through the historical problems that have been plaguing the organization through time. And then having the leader actually sit down and listen and take more of a lateral position and then really break down whatever solutions come out of those thinking and innovation pods to something that can actually resolve. Everyone feels heard and generally better ideas come from multiple perspectives than just one. 
So part of this whole process is about us being able to actually present to people that are leading that full, complete ownership is where the success begins. Now, how does this translate to personal relationships? Now, I know that we're going to be giving the group um, a, um, a outline, a graft mm-hmm. of the HNLP model of, of communication, but I want to kind of move to that because it has so many applications to this one concept of full, complete ownership that keeps us out of the drama triangle. So I just want to just run through this, you know, rather, rather briefly at a high level and then reinforce it with um, with some examples. So we bring in about estimated about two million chunks of data per second through our neurological senses. And that means our sight, visual, our auditory hearing, our olfactory smell, our taste, gustatory and our sense of touch, kinesthetic, and that means emotional as well. So we bring in data per second, about 2 million. We delete, distort, and generalize that data down to about seven to nine pieces consciously. The rest drops into the subconscious. Now, as our filters build from, I think, in utero on, we have to start looking at how these senses become bombarded. Now, we're meaning-making creatures. So when we have an experience, we create constellations of beliefs. So when the neurological senses get bombarded, then we, and after we've deleted, distorted, generalized, stored, and suppressed the excess information that we don't need to survive, It begins showing up then as our memories, as our values, as our beliefs, as our attitudes. Some of the influencing factors in our filters is our language, our race, our cultural influences, our ancestral influences. And there's a variety of others like meta programs, which is our deepest unconscious filters. The information comes in. We delete, distort, and generalize it according to what we've made up so far from our core experiences. And then we create an internal representation, an image like a movie, that creates our emotional states, it affects our physiology, and that drives behavior. So I'm going to break it down just a little bit more. If you've ever studied classical linguistics, words are symbols. They're symbols that actually help us communicate what our senses have actually experienced. The, the, all of our language is actually quite symbolic. Like you think of the word love, love is going to mean something different to you than it's going to mean to me. You have different references for that word love that you'll associate different experiences to, but that word love is a symbol that you ascribe all the experiences where you've had individually experienced love into that. And based upon what your experiences are, you have a certain set definition of love. My definition is going to be a bit different because my experiences are different. And what I made up about those experiences will be different from what you made up from yours. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, for sure. Like if I grew up in a super wealthy family and my experience of love was, oh, my dad got me a new Ferrari for my 16th birthday, you know, or if I grew up in an incredibly poor family and and the experience of love was that I got a new flannel shirt for my birthday. Both expressions, we have we have a different experience. And then we go out into the world as adults. It's like if you're used to having Ferraris every year for your for your birthday and someone shows up to show you love and they give you a flannel shirt because that was their experience. You're going to be like, what? <laughs> That's not love to me. So right. we're going to have different references. That's really a gross example. But but we're going to have different references from every word that symbolizes our experiences. So what I'm suggesting is. Words mean different things to different people based upon the the experiences they've had that they ascribe that word to. 
So and even so, to kind of interject there as well, it, it's also it, it's also a matter of I, I guess maybe this goes into sort of like the love languages kind of things. Like we we also like we need it said to us some of us some of us we need like just be here next to me some you know sometimes it's not this gift at all but it's an entire different expression and the one person can be <laughs> giving that with all their heart and everything to them and the other person is just like doesn't mean anything to me you know and that's where a lot, so much of this comes in is not just understanding but then having the mental and emotional awareness to go um okay, hang on, that didn't land like I wanted it to. <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah, well, it was so funny. I was, Before the love languages were, were written, I was um, about 10 years before that book came out, I was teaching deep love strategies. It was broken down into, into three, which is, is how do you feel most deeply loved? Is it the way that you're touched in that special sort of way? Is it the words that are used spoken in that special tone of voice? Or is it by the actions or gifts that are given that actually make you feel the most deeply loved? And if you could only pick one, which one would would create that deep sense of love? So I was teaching a class in Los Angeles light years ago, and and I was asking the group to identify that. And this one gentleman um, stood up after we were done and he's crying and he said, oh my God. He said, my wife and I just finalized our divorce yesterday. And he said, if I would have known this, I could have saved our relationship. Because he said, she would always say to me, it's not, it's not you touching me and wanting to hug me and, and have sex with me. It's how you how you tell me. You never tell me you love me. You never you never whisper in my ear you love me. You never say those sweet things to me that I have to hear. But because his way of receiving deep love was through touch and sexuality, hers was completely opposite. So she never felt loved. He was frustrated because he thought he was giving her all the signals of love because that's how right, he received right. it. And he was he was a mess that day because he finally realized that without meeting her deep love strategy, she never felt loved, although he was giving her as much love as he felt he possibly could. It was just in the wrong way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah words mean different things to different people. Our associations are different. The word symbolizes our associations to that experience but it's not the experience. It is the symbol of it. So you can tell me you love me all day long. But if it's not according to how my my past experiences have my references, I'm not going to be able to receive it in a way that's going to deeply touch my nervous system. So this is why as we build our people intelligence to understand this is why the greater flexibility we have to shift perspectives and to meet the other person's model of their world, the better communicator and influencer we can become. This is why if we take full ownership of the results that we're getting, not looking at another and saying, well, I said it, or I did X, Y, and Z for you, there's something wrong with you. No, it's about the meaning of your communication is in the response that you get. So if the response is opposite to the intent of what you give, then you have to take ownership of that, have behavioral and emotional flexibility. This is where emotional and mental management come in so essential. You have to take ownership and then respond in a different way till you get the result of the intention of your communication. Yeah, so this you know, is about... Okay. Going, I just want to ahead. highlight something really quickly too, because I don't... I I think sometimes people, people take that taking ownership with taking blame or I'm wrong or any of that with... Because my message, like, oh, okay, I have to say I was wrong. No, the, those aren't synonymous. Those are different ideas that people have, have jammed together. Taking ownership means 
yes, you may have done everything 100% right, correct, everything for you. The intent was there, just like you're saying, the right language for you was there, but it wasn't received. And taking ownership is not saying like, oh, well, I guess I don't know what I'm doing. It's going, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Let's see what this is, right? And then opening up, having that communication, talking with the other person and going, and it sounds so basic when you say the words out loud, but so few people do it. So few people in that moment when they are emotionally triggered because it wasn't received the way they intended, it's so rare that someone stops and goes, okay, hang on. <laughs> Here's what I was trying to convey to you. Here's why I was doing it that way. What's going on? Digging in and then being open, then listening. Um, it's 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 wild how simple yet difficult all of it is. Well, it's because then what happens when someone rejects the way that we show love? We become wounded. And then we start to shut down rather than going, staying true to the intention. My intention is to let you know how much I love you. If it didn't land in the way that my intention was directed, then I have to have the behavioral flexibility to shift the way I've communicated and say, look, my entire intention is to let you know how much I care and love you. And I own the fact that perhaps I didn't deliver it in the way that you can best understand or receive it. But my intention is this, what makes you feel the most deeply loved so I can either demonstrate or give you, communicate to you in the love that my, that's in my heart for you, what would make you feel the most loved? If we just said that rather than, I can't believe that you're always blowing up at me. Well, all I do is like, want to love you. If we just stop that immediate sense of our rejection and hurt, and we look at, stay true to my intention, stay true to what my heart says, and then deliver it in a way that actually will be received. Because when someone responds to us in an angry way, when we're actually attempting to give love, they have some deep, profound wounds that they've not dealt with. If you respond back in a hurtful, reactive way, are you helping the one that you say you love heal or are you further wounding them? So the bottom line is, if we are here in a relationship to hold up the light for the other person when they drop it for themselves, if we're here to love, not to harm, then we take a position of then how can I be more behaviorally flexible to love my partner who's obviously wounded around this topic and who isn't receiving the love that I'm intending and they're super reactive? Then how do I begin to give them the love that they need so that they can begin to start healing the wounds that have haunted them their whole life? Am I here to harm or am I here to heal? And when we take that position, because one person in that relationship, whatever relationship is, has to be the one to take a position of leadership. Has to, or else you'll have two winded pe wounded people, winded too, but wounded people walking down this road of attempting to, give, to get the love they need. I hope you're enjoying this episode. If you want to take a deep dive into the concepts Gary is talking about here and so much more, I've got something for you. From time to time on the show, you may hear us talk about Gary's course, Creating Incredible Relationships. This course is the culmination of Gary's 35 years worth of seminars, one-on-one -on -one training, and transforming the lives of over 11,000 people on four different continents. To learn how to build alignment and heck, just get along with others sometimes, we all require skills that are not commonly known and are not out there in the relationship development space. We need help. That's why Gary put this course together. The content in it is powerful and comprehensive, but just like we've done with this show, it's put together in a way that's easily consumable and quickly implemented. To gain the ability to take every relationship you have or want to have to the next level, Go to garyscourse.com and see how to get started. Now, back to the show.
In my relationship, I made the decision. I would take the responsibility of returning us back to love in any disagreement. So if the disagreement went off the rails and there was no way to get to resolution through a conversation, I would get to resolution in another way. I would simply say, you're super reactive right now. This is absolutely not the time to be discussing this. What do we have to do to return ourselves back to love? You know, you get that kind of response. I go, great. I remember sitting in a car very early on in my 21 year relationship, sitting in a car in Los, in, where was it? It was Palm Springs and saying, I'm not starting a car and driving home until we return back to love. My partner at the time was super stubborn. So it's like, it was like five hours in 115 degree heat sitting oh in a goodness. And I'm like, not starting, not driving home, not doing it until we return back to love. What do we have to do to return back to love? Asking that question. What do I have to do for you? What do you have to do to open up to that love? What do we have to do? And then finally, after dripping in sweat, <laughs> I was told, okay, I'm, I'm ready to have that conversation. I go, great, let's have that conversation. Someone has to take mm. a stand. And if it's not you, then who's it going to be? If your partner is so reactive and so emotionally unresourced, who's it going to be? It's got to be you. So the bottom line is the quicker road to this and what used to take five hours to resolve now takes about eight minutes. Remember we talked about in one of the episodes, this isn't a destination. It is a journey. And my idea of success is you spend less time in the drama triangle and more time in the creator triangle where you get to resolution faster. Doesn't mean your nervous system fired off. All it means is you resolve it faster and tell you there's no, there's no issues. Like as we're bumping up on now 22 years, it's like there's almost no issues. And if there is, we get to resolution really fast. Oh, yeah. And 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 that's the thing, too, is that it, I mean, once again, I mean, this applies to your kids, right? Like you have to take, you have to take that leadership position there. And, and, it, and it isn't easy. It is a very conscious hard in the moment thing to do, especially in the beginning, because you can look at yourself later, ridiculous, right? Like you, you, you know, I can look at myself, hey, 47, and you just, you're having this emotional tantrum, even if they don't see it, because they didn't, you know, your, your child didn't react in the way that... <laughs> that you wanted just like, Oh wow. Okay. Well, that's still a trigger for me. Okay. So obviously let me take that leadership position and say, let me go to them, you know, and I'll do this with, with my boys. Like I'll have that conversation. I'll be wrong with them. You know, I'll go to them and have that open conversation. Just like, I gotta tell you, I'm really frustrated right now. Like I, you know, I don't feel appreciated by you at all. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like if, if you just don't know how to express, you know, but have those conversation and that takes, again, it seems so simple when we sit here and discuss it, but it takes this, it's, it's hard in the moment to kind of take that um, next level of emotional strength to kind of put down the triggered emotions <laughs> and go and have this rational conversation. And, and are you noticing that the more you do that, the easier it becomes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this, this is the whole process that we go through. And it's a gr- huge teaching moment for kids to see, of course, their father so transparent and to be vulnerable and to say, you know, what is occurring and to evoke those conversations that are more truthful because it trains them to have truthful conversations. And as far as I'm concerned, you're one of the best, I don't want to blow your horn too loud here, but you are one of the best dads I've ever come across because you really take that leadership role with your kids and you respect their intellect and you respect the individuation and the individuality of each one of them. And you communicate differently with each one, respecting them and their differences. And I think it's, it's, 
it's we've never you and I ever spoken about this, but there is an eventuation that happens in parenting that at a certain age you have to let go of that sort of directionalized parenting where you're telling the kids what to do. You have to turn into a parent as a coach and you have to bring coaching into the mix to help the child begin to start developing their own sense of discernment and empowering their choice and allowing them to live through consequences and giving him giving them that respect of their budding individuation to help them grow into a strong expression of cause and effect and let them know that this is really the way to success. And someday we'll do a whole episode on that because there's a whole lot I got to say about youth leadership and then turning parents into coaches, because if we don't do that, we just struggle like crazy with our kids as they start to mature and make that transition. Yeah. And, and, to, and to your point too, yeah, the earlier you can do that, the the better. Like it, little little bits of it, right? While you are still there to guide and shift as they experience their own consequences is a big deal. I'm going through, you know, I'm going through that process with my, my oldest, you know, of, I got, you know, like I, I, I gotta let go. Like I am not in control of your every moment of the day. I hope, you know, I'm still, I'm still around. I'm still here, but you know, I understand well, I, you got it. <laughs> There is a point in their maturing that their peers become the greater influence. And what a parent can can hope for is that they have installed the very best sense of right and wrong, the very best sense of operating from a value-driven life, and the very best sense of helping the kids sort of develop what their mission is and what they feel what they feel like they're here to do, and how they treat one another is really the gateway to how they will be happy or unhappy. And to install that within your, your children is, I think, one of, the, one of the pivotal moments in parenting that will designate failure from success or hardship from an easier life for your children. And every single parent that I've ever met has never held their child in their arms and said, I hope you suffer more than me. They always want their child to not go through the pain and turmoil and tribulations that they've gone through. And the way to do that best is to help that child develop their own self-leadership, their own self-accountability, their own self, self-actualization in a way that's going to bring them the strongest sense of who they've come here to be. I personally think that that is one of the primary objectives of parenting is to grow strong, powerful self leaders who are who are engaged and desire to be a good force for self actualization and empowerment of others. Now, I want to kind of squirrel back to this model and the model is that. We know that when an event happens, we create constellations of beliefs. Our attitudes develop out of our emotional states from events that we've created. Our beliefs develop from the same scenarios. Our values develop from the same scenarios. Our language begins to start being used in order to express what we have experienced. Um, Our race influences us. I mean, I grew up with an Hispanic last name. I found out recently that my my beautiful father that raised me is not my biological father. Um, And I don't know who that is, but I know I'm Italian, a Greek, Irish, a touch of Native American blood and a drop of Hispanic blood. So fortunately, I had one of the best fathers ever, um, but not my biological dad. So what I what I know is that that I grew up in an all white neighborhood in Southern California, in San Diego, in a border town. The amount of racism that was directed to me back in the 50s and 60s as a kid was off the charts. It was off the charts. I was the only kid with an Hispanic last name in my elementary school. I would have adults walking their kids to school and telling me I had to walk in the gutter because I was a dirty little wetback. 
And they would say that to me. And I'd go home and I'd go, Dad, what's a wetback? And I developed such a stuttering problem that I couldn't speak as a little boy because of all of this you know, all this external stress from people that I thought were adults. So all this occurred, impacted me. So does race impact a child? Absolutely. And if anyone says, oh, they have the same opportunity as everyone else, they may have the same opportunity, but the internal motivators to take those opportunities have been deeply beaten down by the Mm -hmm. external external prejudice that a child experiences when they're building their sense of self and identity. Make no mistake about it. Then the ancestral influences, if you grew up with the ancestral influence where your parents imprinted their parents, which imprinted their parents, and you grew up in a household of very un- self-actualized individuals, people who had addictions, people who had horrible traumas happen to them that never got healed, you will be impacted by that. It may be to the opposite extreme. It may be in alignment with them. It may be carrying on the same wounds, but you are impacted. So all of these influences impact how we see the world and then the motivation we feel or the lack of it. So fair enough, that happened. Now, what holds it all together is the emotional glue that still makes the past feel real. Feel Still feels like when you think about it, it hits you like a freight train. So what we require to do, and this is another aspect of taking full ownership, is find the tools to neutralize our nervous system. Because our memories are only pictures, sounds, and feelings. That's all they are locked in our nervous system as reference data in a very specific sequence of how our body's visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, kinesthetic took that data in, categorized it. We gave it meaning, but it's still locked into our bodies emotionally. Feelings buried alive, they don't die, they mutate. So later on in some of the episodes, I'll demonstrate a process that will decode our nervous systems in anywhere from three to 15 minutes from trauma. Because if we can begin to start neutralizing those emotional evidences of what's happened to us, then the greater freedom we can get to make the choices towards our evolving self today. That's a first step and being able to neutralize limiting beliefs, align emotions, and begin to start shifting our attitudes to that's where we're going. Not there, but there. So all of this begins to start becoming this powerful system. That's why in one of our episodes, we said this is like opening the owner's manual for the human mind and condition. If we don't know how something works, we can't develop these processes that will free us. A guy developed that process bombing on stage in front of 500 psychotherapists. I brought some guy up from the audience. I only had maybe a quarter of this process developed at that time. I began that process. It wasn't working. The guy had a memory that happened to him the night before. And this process was only good for long-term memories. And this guy came up having witnessed his wife in bed with his best friend the night before. He was shattered. He gets up on stage and I start doing the process. He gets angrier and angrier and angrier. And I'm thinking to myself, it's not working. I stop. I look at him. I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm bombing in front of all these people. What am I going to do? And then I began to start developing this process on the fly, amalgamized all these other techniques, and boom, it worked. Went home, wrote it all out, and have been evolving it for 20 years. So that's the first step. That begins to assist us in having a different internal representations. We're all watching movies in our heads. Many people watch scary movies as they worry about what's coming or what was back there. They're watching the movies attempting to resolve the issues. Remember, the subconscious mind keeps things suppressed until we have the resources to resolve them. And it'll keep rising up those issues until we're able to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and resolve it. 
Once we are begin to start using techniques to resolve the internal representations, which cause the emotions and affect the physical body, that's when our behavior starts to change. I've always asked people, do you think your emotional states have anything to do with your health? They have everything to do with your health. If you look at epigenetics, the emotional states you live in will either turn on the genes for disease or turn them off. Wow. So we have to start looking at how powerful the internal representations are, the words that we speak, the unresolved emotions we live in as the precursor to actually having our bodies actually be healthy. So all this becomes this powerful motivator for taking full ownership of our own emotional states, heals our relationships, begins to start assisting us in living a much healthier life, acts as an influencing agent to everyone we love. There is only wins by practicing this mental emotional management, and there's only losses by remaining a victim. Yeah, I, I, I love this as, and again, we will we'll definitely walk people through this specific process you're talking about there with that. Um, but I love it so much as both an alternative to shoving it down and not ever addressing those things, which we know <laughs> is it's coming back one way or the other, but also an alternative to, you know, 15 years of talking about it and staying in it and living it and because you're just bringing it up over and over and over again. And maybe after 15 years, it gets <laughs> resolved or lessened. But in the meantime, uh, you're just, you're reliving it. And there's that process that you're talking about really addresses it, gets rid of it, allows you to move on, go to the next thing. Absolutely. And this is why, you know, the whole art and science of HNLP is so important. Um, it is, um, a powerful system of tools that are quick term and long lasting. And I tell people, you know, after 15 minutes doing this process or five or three, even I've had events, traumas released in, in, you know, as little as three minutes, that it's a permanent change. It's not something that comes back with the same emotional hit ever again. And at some point when we go into this, I'll explain how that works. Um, there's quite um, a bit of biology behind it. And um, then we'll dive more into the, um, the actual specifics of that particular process. But it's a very important process. It's one of the cornerstones of the work that I've done with people over the you know, 35 years of my career. Awesome. Well, I think this is a good good place to wrap on this um, this critical aspect of of self ownership and that mental emotional mastery. Um, you know, a term that you used is you know reality as a construct. Right? We create our own realities by how we react to things and what we bring to things. Um, and you've outlined this great explanation of all that. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm sure want we got. I'm going to put one more cap on this before we go. Please, please. Is that when our emotions lessen around events, which are our filters, and our beliefs begin to change and our values become aligned, the capability of placing a different meaning around the events that used to trigger us is so much easier. Mm. If you're attempting to change the meaning you're ascribing to event, but you're feeling all these triggers, it's next to impossible to ascribe a different meaning, which is the beginning of how you begin to practice self-leadership. This is why your personal work is so vital to your relationship success. That's huge. Yeah. That's great. That's great. That's great. Awesome. Well, I look forward to the next one, Gary. Okay. And we will see you all next time. Okay. God bless. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Concentric. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd certainly like a great review from you on your favorite podcasting platform. But more than that, what really makes a difference to a show like ours is a recommendation to someone who would love this show like you do. Word of mouth referrals to your network and your podcast devouring friends is incredibly helpful to the growth of this show. 
For episode links and info, go to concentricshow.com. Thank you so much. And remember to keep building alignment to build a better life. 